Hi, this is Mark Pugh with The Upload, and I'm happy to have with me Kathy Hubble from Australia. And you'll notice that she's not from around the south of Atlanta, where I am, but south of the equator uh, when she starts talking. I look back through LinkedIn, and Kathy, we've been uh, connected since 2016. Uh, I didn't realize it had been that long. How you doing this, uh, this evening for you, this morning for me? Yeah, great. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me. Um, in talking back through kind of the conversations we've had on LinkedIn, I, we've not met personally, hopefully at some point we will, um, but um, uh, back on our conversations on LinkedIn, I know you had this idea um, for helping people and you were helping people as an individual professional, um, but as I recall, there was some frustration that you weren't scalable um, for the three million or so people in chronic pain in Australia. Can, um, can you kind of describe what you did in your professional uh, practice and then what brought you to the epiphany that what you were doing um, was great but could only reach tens, tens of people at times? Yeah, so I've been uh, working in chronic pain management for the last 20 years and uh, loving running the chronic pain management program, a multidisciplinary program, which enables people to live with their pain, reduce their opioids and get back into life uh, in a measured and accountable way. Uh, but very frustrating because I could only help 10 people at a time in our group programs face to face. So I wanted a way that I could actually expand uh, the access because we have a really, really big problem with access in Australia and I'm pretty sure you guys have the similar problem and that is we a have... A country uh, with a lot of rural areas in Australia. Yeah, yeah, it's not just the physical access, it's the actual um, access to quality evidence-based pain management clinics and we have a 12 to 18 month waiting time to access mm. those clinics. Um, and that's if you live in the city. So if you're in the rural sector, which is a lot of Australia, uh, there's absolutely nothing. And so we've got a lot of people who are just really, really struggling. Uh, 3.2 million people at the moment uh, in Australia that are really struggling with chronic pain. And it's costing us around 73 billion a year. Mm. So a, a massive problem. It's actually more than heart disease, diabetes and cancer combined, which actually, when people start to think about it, uh, it that, that's overwhelming and uh, it's a great so when you say, tragedy. When you say cost in 73 billion, what, what, what mm -hmm. I, I've heard a lot of numbers talked about in regards to the impact of chronic pain, but what does that cost include? So it, it, it includes the loss of productivity uh, the loss of income, the loss of, um, you know, money that we're, the people are paying out for medications and accessing uh, health care. They are a very big burden on, um, on our acute health services, which are not adequate enough to understand and manage chronic pain in the, um, uh, in the acute setting. And, uh, and then we've got um, people that are accessing their super funds early because they're retiring early uh, because of chronic pain. And therefore, we've actually got an aging population that are poorer than mm. uh, previously. So there's a massive array of, uh, you know, different aspects of how this cost has come about. And, if you like, I can actually forward you the um, uh, the, the article from uh, Access Economics and Deloitte uh, that actually breaks down all of those costs. Gotcha. Yeah, that would be very helpful because I know we've talked about the cost of chronic pain um, in the in the United States. When you think about cost, you think about finance, um, but obviously there's an emotional cost, um, there's a relational cost, there's a personal cost associated with that as well. And I assume in your professional practice, you know, you want to save money for the people that employed you or, or utilized your, your services. Um, but you're obviously dealing individually with individuals um, that are suffering those personal costs, um, which gets to that whole 
biopsychosocial spiritual treatment model that I know um, you and I agree wholeheartedly on. Um, how do you how do you apply that when someone is, is so impacted on so many different levels um, from a cost standpoint? Um, how do you help them through that? I guess what we do is we look at uh, their needs. And what we're trying to give people is a values-based care and looking at what do they need in order to uh, relieve their suffering and their disability. And I think that's where a lot of pain management clinics have really lost their way. We're not looking at what uh, the individual needs are. And um, and I'm just going to, to um, take a quote here from the uh, International Association of the Study of Pain. And that is that, um, you know, pain and disability is strongly related to uh, catastrophizing behaviors, fear avoidance behavior, depression, anxiety, and sleep interference, which is uh, something that we really don't pay enough attention to. And then we've got perceived injustice. But most importantly, we've got low self-efficacy. And if people don't have the confidence in themselves to be able to do things despite pain, they actually end up having a downward spiral of the uh, psychosocial problems which create the disability and the suffering. And it's mm -hmm. those areas that we want to address and assist people with so that they can plan and strategize their recovery. And a lot of those things that you mentioned uh, certainly feed on one another, um, unfortunately, and, and probably as catastrophization increases, the sense of victimhood, the sense of lack of um, locus of control, you know, all those things start, um, start to impact one another. Um, so uh, I know that you have created a company called Emilio Health. Um, that is primarily focused on taking what you've learned and creating a scalable platform for that. And the psychosocial component is, is so important and oftentimes so overlooked on that. So um, can you describe a little bit how your platform um, has created a way of not only dealing with the biomedical um, components of the pain, the, the, the source of the pain um, in trying to figure out, you know, um, what's physically wrong, but also that psychosocial component because as you said all of that is is very important oftentimes overlooked um especially when people become more focused on trying to find somebody to do something to them as opposed mm. to them trying to figure out how they can self-manage uh and yeah. cope uh, whatever whatever method that might be yeah so we saw a great big gap in uh uh, what was happening within the um the learning about uh chronic pain uh, not only in the person who is suffering with chronic pain, but also in the health professionals uh, sector. And so we, we targeted um, a solution that incorporated integrating the health professional into the pain program so that they went through the learning pathways with the person who is suffering from pain. So we literally are online walking the uh, um, health professional through the pain program while they're facilitating it for us and uh, with the person who is suffering. We start off with uh, educating people on the neuroscience behind chronic pain and the sensitized nervous system and how uh, things like catastrophizing behaviors uh, increase suffering through the activation of the amygdala and the, uh, the prefrontal cortex and the, the um, hypothalamus. And so what we're doing is we're actually uh, educating uh, the person who has pain, but also the health professional that's going through with them. And they have certain tasks that they have to do together to start planning how they're going to recover. And in doing that, we're getting the health professional to do a, um, a reflective type of learning through look, see, do, and then be uh, self-examining and analysis. 
and that looks very similar to uh, Bloom's taxonomy if ever you've um, had a look at any learning theories and it's where you get um, accomplishment and mastery of a, uh, um, a learning process and uh, so all of the platform has been embedded with Bloom's taxonomy of learning theory, but also the uh, competencies from the International Association of the Study of Pain. So we look at all aspects of how pain impacts a person's life and how they can plan their way to recovery. I think it's really interesting. Uh, you know, there's so many, um, I, I say so many, there's t tools out there for patients um, but I, not a lot of physicians understand the treatment of chronic pain. Um, as, as far as I am, uh, as far as I know, I believe the pain management specialty was something that um, uh, just began in the late 90s. Um, and a lot of the pain management specialists that I, I have uh, reviewed or ch chatted with um, have started with the specialty of anesthesiology. Um, which is an interesting combination of anesthesiologists, which their focus is for you to feel zero pain, um, uh, you know, during surgery uh, and in pain management, which is really about helping you overcome pain um, that you're going to feel regardless of what happens. Um, and I don't think doctors get enough training, um, especially those that didn't go through some kind of pain management in, in education. What, what's been your feedback from providers um, that have accessed your, your platform um, that may have never heard of the neuroscience in regards to pain, or maybe it was one semester medical school 20 years ago that they kind of touched on the subject, um, and certainly about the, you know, the concept of mindfulness and the concept of, you know, um, you know all the different things that you're covering there. Um, what, what has been the response for providers? Because I, I would think that um, they would be like sponges wanting to know this information. Yeah, they are and they aren't. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, cognitive dissonance in, um, in health professionals as well as people who uh, are suffering in pain. And um, I think that goes in line with, uh, you know, remuneration in terms of um, outcomes financially. So there are people who are more geared towards uh, quick fixes um, but I think now they're starting to become aware of um, the failure of the current medical practices that, um, you know, just don't work for chronic pain. And so they're, they're holding their hands up going, well, what else do we do now? You know, there's, mm -hmm. you know, and so when you come along with a solution like this that is, um, you know, very, very easy to access. It takes people through step by step and we're supporting them 100% of the time all the way through both sides. So the health professional and the, uh, the person in pain and we're measuring our outcomes and we're data driven. So we're, we're constantly looking at how we can do things better for the person that's suffering with this condition. I think we need to, um, take on board that we've created a fantastic awareness in um, chronic pain management in the last, particularly in the last 10 years with the likes of uh, Lorimer Mosley and uh, you know some of the people that have been around the world actually spreading the word. However, that hasn't changed practice. And I think we need to have a really good look at why that hasn't changed and I think We've given people a lot of information, but we actually haven't shown them how to do it. And mm -hmm. I think that's the fundamental um, process that we've really engaged with uh, in this platform is that we're taking people uh, by the hand, walking them through it and saying, this is how you do it and this is why we do it this way. Uh, so that they have a really good fundamental understanding of the um, the neuroscience, the measures, and then the outcomes, and what we're trying to achieve. And without giving away your secret sauce, um, what kind <laughs> of outcomes um, do you track and measure? Because I, I know in our conversations, you are very evidence-based, um, science-driven. 
Um, so this isn't stuff that you're just making up. These are best practices and the no, standard of care right. as it should be from pain. So what what are the important measurements of success and progress um, that you think showed to not only the patient but the provider um, that this treatment is is being successful? So the first thing that we do is we teach the uh, um, well, we're using rehabilitation providers at this point because that's the market we're targeting. So what we do is we teach them how to use the specific tools that we've decided are the most effective tools for measuring the outcomes. Those particular tools are the um, Promise 29, which is uh, one that um, Beth Darnell uh, has shown me. And uh, we absolutely love it because we can actually see how pain actually impacts every part of a person's life. And we can see very clearly through the program because we're doing it every two weeks. Uh, we can see what we're good at and what we're not good at and we can actually adjust the program accordingly. We look at uh, the chronic pain acceptance questionnaire. So whether they are willing to engage in activities that, uh, you know, despite pain and whether they have a lot of fear avoidance behaviours. And then we also use a, um, a pain self-efficacy questionnaire developed by Michael Nicholas, for Professor Michael Nicholas from the uh, ADAPT program and Sydney University. So that particular tool is absolutely key to seeing when a person starts to change the way they're thinking and, and start to become confident that they can do things despite pain. And then we also look at the uh, um, pain catastrophizing score. So we can see how much people are actually ruminating or they're magnifying or they are having helplessness uh, thoughts and, and emotions. And so measuring along those, um, with those tools that are now reliable and, and valid, we can actually do some um, pretty uh, funky stuff when it comes to uh, correlation coefficients and and um, and measuring, you know, the uh, the changes and where they're occurring, uh, and that that is really really exciting um, to to start to see these outcomes coming out of the uh, the back of the platform. I find it interesting, number one, that you didn't mention the frowny face to smiley face uh, scale of <laughs> one to ten. Yeah. Um, and I also, um, it was very interesting that all of the tools that you're using to measure, the, the ones that you disclosed, um, have nothing to do with whether they can bend over, uh, whether they can walk 50 feet. It's all about what's inside their head and how they're managing pain. So you've yeah. kind of completely flipped the script in regards to um, the measurement of the management of pain, less about function and flexion and more about their brain and how they're processing it. Yeah, and, they're, and their confidence so um, and their beliefs. If, if we look at a person and they have been told by their doctor, if they bend over, they're going to pop that disc right out you know, or my back's going to go out or, you know, the language that they use. That's that's a really big thing that we um, emphasise with our, our health professionals when they're going through the training is to listen to the person's story and listen to the language that they're using to describe their pain and, um, and how their life is, you know, how they're not coping. So... Um, if you have a person who believes that if they bend over, their, their back's going to go out, then they won't bend over. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter how much you want to measure their function. <laughs> if their belief is that their back is going to break uh, if they bend over, you never they're going to be self-limiting. So mm -hmm. you've got to change that way, the mindset and the way they're thinking in order to get them to start functioning uh, and have confidence that they can move. And it's, um, I think that's the fundamental flaw that we've been missing. We've been looking at function and we've been looking at, you know, interventions and um, trying to stop pain completely before people will start moving. And I think what we've got to do is not be fearful of pain, 
but actually start moving with confidence that we're not causing any more damage and that there's a, a huge uh, buffer between um, hurt and harm. And we've and if we can instill that knowledge from the beginning of why people have pain, where it comes from and how the brain constructs it, then we can start to uh, give them confidence that they can move without causing damage. Uh, that's beautifully said and, and completely different than the vast majority <laughs> of <laughs> providers out there and actually patients, I think, to some degree. So right. I, I think, um, you know, that that is awesome. As, as we kind of wrap this up, um, I always like to um, kind of provide that one final little keynote, that one takeaway um, that uh, the person I'm interviewing wants to leave the audience. And uh, obviously, uh, since this is on YouTube, all 7 billion people on planet Earth can see it. Um, not all 7 billion have subscribed yet to my YouTube channel, but um, <laughs> It's, uh, you know, there could be patients that look at this, there could be providers that look at this, there could be payers that look at this, there could be policymakers or regulators that look at this. Um, so, you know, there's a variety of different individuals out there. Um, what would be your one takeaway um, that you would want people to, and you, you've provided great nuggets already of, of wisdom mm -hmm. um, in regards to the management of pain and kind of that whole paradigm change of focusing on how they think about pain as opposed to um, what they can do with pain. Um, but what, what would that takeaway be um, for you? I think the most important thing is that we've got to listen to the person and actually really hear what they're trying to say to us and what their needs are. Um, I have a, a, a wonderful mentor, uh, Vanessa Hall, who speaks to people all over the world on trust and uh, she gave me a great um, uh, narrative to go by. And that was to ask our patients or our clients, our claimants, whatever you want to call them, um, what do you need and how can I help? Which is a whole lot different than if you bend over, your, your back is going to break. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, it's it builds that trust and that that uh, collaboration and kind of that um, rapport that enables them to be open and transparent and honest with you. And once you've got that honesty and transparency going, you can share yeah. a lot of tricks for them and helping them and they're going to trust you on it. And that's that's the key is is to establish that trust, but also know that we're always going to give them the truth mm -hmm. and, um, you know, as, as close to the truth that we can possibly um, ascertain in terms of, um, you know, evidence-based. And, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing that is, that's in our program that hasn't been researched and researched and, and looked at in immense um, thoroughness that uh, we've given them the best possible quality answers to their, their problems. Gotcha, trust and truth. That's, That's I, I like alliteration, simple stuff, and trust and truth both start with a T, works out great. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. It's been a pleasure to be connected with you on LinkedIn virtually. I, I hope at some point we will be able to meet um, in person, but you've done a wonderful job, um, I think, in this video as well as the program that you've created um, in changing the paradigm um, of how we think in pain. And I, I look forward to seeing and reading and hearing more about Emilio Health and you personally um, as you help people in Australia and around the world. So I uh, really enjoy our relationship and I uh, look forward to continuing um, uh, sharing information back and forth. You can also look at our YouTube um, video on Emilio Health and it's just called Emilio Health. So it'll, you can look that up as well. It gives you a, a little bit of a demo of uh, what the platform looks like. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Kathy. We really appreciate your time and, and dedication to this. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Take care. You too.